dying. So this is a serious case. Texaco, now Chevron, argued for 10 years that this case should be sent in Ecuador. And now that their own samples and the court case is going poorly for them, um, they're now saying that the case and the trial is not fair. And the role of Ecuador in supporting this lawsuit of the tens of thousands of uh, Amazonian residents, what power does it have in this lawsuit? Atulsi. This, um, I didn't hear your question. Can you please repeat? The power that the Ecuadorian government has in this lawsuit. Well, first of all, the, for, for again, for, for over the last five years, Chevron's tried with previous administrations to, to do everything it can in its power to get the Ecuadorian government to dismiss this case, the Ecuadorian court systems to dismiss this case without luck. Now, this is, you know, what, um, what this case has the power to do is really Chevron, for the first time, is standing trial in an uh, area where it operated without, you know, and up to now without impunity. It is now being asked uh, to stand trial and face, uh, you know, face justice. And we have to let the judicial process um, have its course. You know, this is Chevron's attempt to interfere with the due process of law, a pillar of democracy. So the fact that, you know, Texaco argued this case deserves to be heard in Ecuador, that Ecuador was a fair and transparent court system, um, and then had to go and basically present itself in the in, in jurisdiction of of the Ecuadorian courts is where it is now. And now, you know, the U.S. court did say that that was a condition upon sending the case to Ecuador, that basically um, Chevron would submit itself to the jur jurisdiction of Ecuadorian courts. Now that things are going badly for Chevron, I think it's now trying to squash this case. And, it, you know, it's outrageous that in the Isikoff article, Chevron spokesperson was quoted as saying, we can't let little countries screw around with big companies like this. I think this is ultimately what this is about. Chevron's used to bullying its way and, you know, play, playing power politics, and this is not working out for them in Ecuador. For the rest of the world, what this case means, I think this is really a signal to the oil industry that the days of operating in areas without impunity are over, and that really there is a, a way for communities in the um, developing world to bring corporations um, to justice. If, uh, if Chevron were to get what it wants, Michael Isikoff, uh, an ending to the special trade preferences for Ecuador, what would that mean for this South American country? Well, uh, it would have a devastating impact on um, uh, large segments of the Ecuadorian economy that depend on exports to the United States, uh, uh, broccoli, flowers. Uh, uh, there are a number of uh, um, economic sectors that are heavily dependent on these Andean trade uh, preferences. Uh, which have been, you know, part of the law for the last several years. So uh, the Ecuadorian ambassador uh, to the United States told me this would have an enormous disruption um, on his uh, 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 on his country's economy. Uh, Ecuador is a relatively impoverished country to begin with. Um, so uh, to lose something like uh, um, uh, like these trade benefits would be, you know, would have a would have a real impact. So this is a race to the finish here, Chevron pushing very hard in Washington when you have the prospect of an Obama presidency. Right. I should also point out that the Andean trade uh, preferences uh, uh, law expires at the end of the year anyway. So uh, uh, it, it does need a renewal. I think what the Chevron people want is an amendment uh, attached to uh, uh, the trade benefits bill this year, which they can get in Congress if the Bush administration does not act, uh, that would uh, have the effect of, of, of doing what they want, that would either uh, remove Ecuador or uh, uh, require Ecuador to be removed if it doesn't take the sort of action uh, on the legal case that Chevron is, is seeking. Well, Michael Isikoff, I want to thank you for being with us from the streets of Washington, D.C. I want to thank um, Atosa Sultani for joining us uh, in Los Angeles. And I want to turn now to the second part of uh, Chevron's case. Uh, it is the story I mentioned um, in the lead about last month's decision, the Senate dropping an effort to penalize Chevron for maintaining extensive ties uh, to the military junta in Burma, the Senate approving new 
trade sanctions against Burma, but excluding a provision that would have eliminated a large Chevron tax break. Burmese activists have supported the provision to pressure Chevron to end its ties to the junta. The measure had been named after the late Tom Lantos, the California congressman who was a Burma advocate, survived the Holocaust, the only member of the uh, Congress to uh, have survived the Holocaust. We're joined now by Marco Simons, legal director of Earth Rights International. The significance of this defeat for pro-democracy activists in Burma and the major role that uh, the California senator, Dianne Feinstein, play, uh, played in the defeat. Well, it's hard to, to say exactly what role Senator Feinstein played, although we do know that she has been close to Chevron in the past. But I don't want to overstate the importance of this provision in the context of the overall Burma sanctions measure, and I don't want to overstate Chevron's power on Capitol um, Hill. That's really low. Sorry. The, uh, as, can you hear me now? We hear, we hear you just fine. Okay. I don't want to overstate Chevron's power on Capitol Hill, because, frankly, this provision was, was a fairly minor provision in the overall context of the sanctions. This provision would have targeted about $30 million in tax write-offs that Chevron gets to avoid double taxation between the Burmese military junta and the U.S. government. But the much bigger picture of Chevron's project in Burma, which is a massive natural gas project, is that this project provides about a billion dollars annually in hard currency to the Burmese junta, which is a massive proportion of that regime's income. So, in the grand scheme of things, this was a relatively small part of the sanctions. And what may be much more significant to, to the regime itself is not Chevron's tra tax preferences, but financial sanctions that may that are part of this bill that may help to cut off the flow of cash to the regime. If this provision had really been targeting something that would have gone directly to the junta's bottom line, that would have really affected the cash flowing into the regime, I don't know that Chevron would have had the power to stop it, because in recent years, while Chevron certainly does have power on Capitol Hill, they have not actually had the power to, to get Congress, for example, to dismiss other human rights lawsuits against Chevron. Chevron lobbied very forcefully to, uh, to uh, cause amendments to the Alien Tort Statute, a human rights law under which Chevron is being sued for human rights abuses in Nigeria, for example. And that lobbying effort failed. And they failed to, to get the U.S. State Department to intervene in the case to say that this case would interfere with foreign policy with Nigeria. People, so, people may be surprised to know that uh, Chevron is the only U.S. Uh, multinational corporation, uh, oil company, grandfathered in, that is allowed to operate in Burma right now. Um, can you explain that and how significant Chevron's uh, support for the Adana pipeline is for the Burmese regime? regime's continuation. Sure. The Adana pipeline itself is immensely important for the Burmese regime. It's, it probably provides somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of the hard currency income to the regime, which is vital for it to purchase arms and other uh, materiel that it needs to get on international markets. And the Adana pipeline came online about 10 years ago, and before that point, the regime was facing a tremendous shortage of hard currency, was almost in a financial meltdown, and then suddenly hundreds of millions of dollars annually, up to a billion dollars now, were injected into the regime's coffers, and it's been keeping it afloat for the last 10 years. Chevron's participation in that is somewhat less significant, because the project goes on with or without Chevron. So regardless of whether Chevron stays in or pulls out, this billion dollars annually is still flowing to the to the, the military regime. That money doesn't come from Chevron. The money comes from Thailand because Thailand's buying the gas. So until you stop Thailand from paying for the gas or until you cause banks to stop processing those payments, the money is still going to be flowing to the regime's coffers. Chevron's participation is offensive in that it's definitely profiting off of human rights abuses against the Burmese people. 
but whether Chevron stays or goes doesn't necessarily make a huge difference to the junta itself. Well, I'll leave it there. Marco Simons, thanks so much for being with us, uh, legal director of Earth Rights International, speaking to us from Washington, D.C. Coming up, we go to Mexico City to the International Conference on AIDS. Stay with us.